Position. Uh, so uh, I, I love the opportunity to announce this in front of you guys, uh, this talented group. Uh, so if you could put into your minds that this position is available, uh, not just for you, but maybe for somebody that you might know that's searching for a full-time position. Uh, again, it's a, a project manager slash UX uh, position. So people that have skills of taking applications from the beginning development stages all the way to the deployment stages, understanding how that process goes. Obviously, work with wireframes, prototypes, things like that. Uh, just uh, user experience friendly. Know, know how important the usability of the application is. So, if you know of anybody, I, I'd love to get connected with, with you guys after, have some cards, or if you know of somebody uh, that you would like to get me connected with, that'd be great too. So, thank you and thanks for the time, Brent. Appreciate it. Uh, <coughs> Chelsea. Next Hi. I'm Chelsea. I work at Active Network. Um, we build participant management software for uh, event directors, and we also work with one CAs on data organizations. And right now, we're doing a lot of hiring. So we're moving our high coach from San Diego to Dallas. So we're hiring UX designers, researchers, graphic designers, and then we're also looking for some iOS and Ruby developers. So if you're any of those things, if you know someone that is, uh, let one of us know over here, and we'll definitely like try to talk to you guys about it. Matt, well, stand up. Yeah, go ahead, stand up. So, Matt Cubing, uh, work at Fidelity Investments. We're not actively hiring right now, so we will be soon. Looking for people, um, all kinds of developers. I work, it's not a financial services position, it's tools like Node or Rails, if you're a user experience designer, a researcher, we're looking for all levels of that. Uh, connect with me on LinkedIn or talk to me after. So the, the position's wide open. So talk to Matt, Chelsea, or uh, Damon after this meeting. So uh, what I want to do is go ahead and introduce Joshua Hall. Now uh, go ahead and stand up, Josh. I'm going to publicly embarrass Josh for a moment. Good luck. Okay. Right. So the reason uh, I wanted Josh to put this panel together is that he blends both uh, usability testing 
and playtesting because playtesting was in his background. The first question that we asked in his interview was, I don't know, sorry, mm -hmm. your name. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, no. It was, what's the difference between playtesting and usability testing? He gave a great answer. And I always thought in the back of my mind that would make a good panel for this particular crowd. So I asked him a couple of months back to go ahead and enter, uh, see if he couldn't introduce some of his friends to this crowd and just have a conversation. So this is going to be a little bit different. We normally have presentations. This is probably the first panel that we've had in three years. So, uh, Josh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and give it up for Josh, and he's going to introduce the panel. at Sabre, uh, and prior to working at Sabre, I was a playtest analyst at Gearbox Software, which is a video game development studio. Uh, we made the Borderlands series, Brothers in Arms, all kinds of fun stuff. So, um, what we're going to be doing tonight, this is going to be kind of a lot more informal. Um, if anyone at any point has any questions, I have, let me show you guys my awesome notes that I, uh, I, I have some, some <laughs> questions that I will be asking them. And then afterwards, I'll open it up to a sort of Q&A. Anybody who has any questions about uh, video game uh, user research, things like that, can go ahead and ask them. Uh, just as an <coughs> FYI, um, there are obviously certain topics that they can't discuss. They can't talk about projects they are working on right now. They, uh, there are certain other things as well. Uh, go ahead and ask them anyway, but there may be a few cases where they'll have to say, sorry, we can't talk about that, or whatever. Uh, so why don't we start by everyone introducing themselves. I'm going to sit back down because I don't want to stand there. Um, so how about you guys introduce yourselves, who you are, where you work, what you do, and all that good stuff. Hi everybody, uh, my name is John Cohen. I am the user research manager at Gearbox Software. Uh, so I run our external playtesting department. Uh, what that means is we, we basically have a, a playtesting lab where we can recruit and bring in participants from outside the studio to come experience games that are in various stages of development. By feedback. Uh, in addition to that, we collect data from the games themselves and uh, hold group discussions with these individuals to get a sense of what they're feeling about the game, where the game stands, and then we kind of transition those results back to the developers and kind of work within that iterative design. Okay. Uh, I'm Matt Strait. I'm a faculty member at Field Hall at SMU. Uh, it's a master's program for building video games <coughs> in which I teach, them, among other things, uh, how to do user research. Prior to that, I ran uh, THQ's uh, user research group, which was their video game publisher for video game publisher. Uh, before that, I was at Microsoft doing user research for their games. Hi, my name is Stephanie Fury. I work with id Software. That's a studio that's owned by Bethesda, our publisher. Uh, I run the usability department for us. I'm their external usability manager. So I interface with all of our external people who come in and play test our games and kind of work as the middleman between our testers who come in and our production and development teams and kind of give them some guidance on how to improve their projects, where people are struggling, where they're having issues, learning how to interact with their games, and just figuring out systems in general. <coughs> okay. All right. Uh, a quick question for the audience. Uh, who in the audience has uh, worked on a video game or done gamification of some sort? Okay, great. Great. Okay. So I guess we'll kind of jump into this. Um, so I guess my first question for you guys, I don't know if everyone here is aware of how playtesting works and how it differs uh, from more uh, traditional academic testing in, in a lab environment. So if you guys could talk about what those differences are. All right, so I tend to, my background's in cognitive psychology, experimental science, uh, or cognitive science, experimental psychology. Uh, so I tend to approach playtesting like a uh, psychology study. Um, the biggest difference between doing academic research for me and, and playtesting the games is honestly the issues of control. Um, when you're dealing with something as complex as a video game, like one of the games that uh, Josh mentioned, where you have all of these different factors that play all at once, um, between procedurally generated weapons and gear for the players, um, to you know, levels that span hours at a time. Um, there are a lot of things that you just can't control for, like you could in the lab environment. Um, so learning to let go of some of that and kind of let the chaos just be chaos 
um, and then let that help kind of guide some of your interpretation of the data. That's one of the biggest differences that I found. Um, beyond that, uh, you get to work with gamers, which is great. Um, you know, sometimes if you're, if, you're doing, if you're doing academic research, um, you may love the topic, um, but you know you don't get to necessarily converse with people about the things that they love. Um, one of the greatest parts about the work, I don't know if you guys would agree, but, but uh, you know, getting to work with gamers and talk about the things that they enjoy and the things that they don't enjoy about the games they're playing um, is a lot of fun. It adds a lot of flavor to the study. Okay. And I think we do have some interesting challenges with, with the types of software we work with. Like John said, it's a very complex project. Uh, the products, there's so many different features and components within it. A lot of times it's difficult to filter out noise across different features. You know, if someone's struggling with the UI, it's difficult to tell it's in the text, or is it because there's just so many other things in the game that's distracting them from the UI? Sometimes it's difficult for us to identify problems. Also, the, the demographics we work with. Uh, those of you who've done anything with the video games, you know, that are target audience gamers, sometimes are not the, the most socially adept people, and occasionally we have the the extreme introverts come in who just aren't used to verbalizing what they're experiencing. You're trying to do a think aloud study with someone who's just not used to talking to people, much less talking while they're doing something. It becomes incredibly difficult to get useful data from them. Yeah, I would add the other thing uh, that's a big difference, I think, is the scope of what we're looking at and the timelines that we function on. So if I can't get data back to a team within a week, a day or two, like it's useless. So I'm not going to go out and do a broad like collection of data to figure out like what is fun like, as a definition. Uh, all I really care about is like is this current is it fun and why not? Um, One of the other things I wanted to ask you guys about because this is a topic I was discussing. With Brian seems to have walked off. Anyway, um, the topic I was discussing with Brian uh, earlier today actually that he thought was really fascinating was the. Uh, the playtest interns we would bring in. And, and, and basically, for those of you who are not aware, uh, one of the things that Gearbox does, and I believe you guys at ASU do the same thing, right? Uh, they'll bring in interns to come in for a couple of weeks at a time, and they're, they're actual employees of the company, they're getting paid, basically to be a longitudinal participant. Uh, they play through the entire game from start to finish, sometimes multiple times. Um, and have, they have to give regular feedback over everything they've gone through, uh, everything that, they, that they've experienced. That's actually how I got started at Gearbox. Do you guys want to talk about that anymore, or did I do it for you, Josh? Yeah, there's a couple of benefits to that, um, as opposed to just doing like the standard play test where you've got your Kleenex testers in for you know, three, four hours of time. They don't really get to understand a lot of the, uh, the intricate systems within a product, and you also have difficulty gauging things like you know, in a game that has multiplayer, how long are people going to play this game? They think it's cool for three hours, but how about after three hours of playing it? It's very useful in us getting certain types of data that there's really no other way to get. And I know in the case of Borderlands, that is such a massive game. I'm sure that's why you utilize that type of tester. So, um, next question I have for you guys. Uh, what are some recent trends that you can tell me about uh, games user research at the moment. Just things that you have been involved with, things that you've been privy to that you are allowed to talk about. Really, I think just user research itself in the industry is a new trend. Okay. I mean, 10 years ago, there were a few people that did it. It was mostly first party, Sony, Microsoft, a couple of larger publishers had some small groups that did user research. But now it's blowing up where a lot of indie studios even are hiring that that one UI designer that also has experience running user research studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'd agree with that. I'd say that they also keep looking at new methods. Uh, although I'd say that the recent trend is to move away from things like biometrics. Okay. Uh, for a couple of years, everyone's really big on like eye tracking and skin response. Uh, anything else you could possibly feel like showed up to on a person. You know, uh, and it's just the payoff for it versus the amount of time it takes to go through and analyze it. And then again, they still basically don't have to ask the person, like, hey, what was that? Um, I think this year, the biggest, this first year, I've really seen everyone kind of just be like, nah, forget it. Uh, and I do feel like third party testing companies that like, now is their bread and butter, and now they're like, nope, not worth it. I completely agree with that. Okay. Yeah, the payoff is not. One of the other trends that I've seen is kind of the 
reliance on big data. Okay. Larger data sets after games are live. So you know, it's one thing to, to, to test a game while it's development to try to iterate on, on the features and processes within the game to basically make it the best version it possibly be before it's released. But it's also another to track that game after it's released to see how the players are interacting with it. Uh, so many games have they have such great online components that they're not already just always online. MMOs like World of Warcraft, your games like League of Legends. So those games can be constantly patched and updated to respond to behaviors within the community. So kind of looking at those trends in larger data sets, uh, like telemetrics and behavioral responses, even even only people after a game is launched can become something uh, that more and more folks are doing. And one thing that actually reminds me of is sometimes they'll even include the player in on some of that. I remember uh, as I was playing through the, uh, the Telltale Games uh, Walking Dead series, um, it's, it, the game involves a series of choices that you have to make, and at the end of the game, it will give you a breakdown of how your choices compare to everybody else who's playing it. So it will say, oh, you know, you were in line with 95% of other gamers, you know, you all did the same thing, or, you know, yeah, horrible, always horrible thing. Anyway, so, um, so the next question I have for you guys, there seems to be a convergence happening right now between uh, things like board games, tabletop gaming, and... Um, mobile technology, tablets, uh, phones, things like that. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, on, on how that's going and whether or not it's a good thing now. I think it's a fantastic thing. Yeah, yeah. I agree fully. Yeah, I'm a huge nerd, so I'm a big Dungeons & Dragons player. Um, and the newest edition of Dungeons & Dragons just launched, and before that they did a massive two-year little beta with like 170,000 people, and they were soliciting feedback on a regular basis from playtesters across the world and collecting, improving the game, iterating it just like the way we do it. Um, you know, of course, it's analog versus digital, uh, digital games, but like, you know, seeing playtesting happening on, on that kind of a scale is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there, there seems to be a trend nowadays of, of taking certain board games and making tablet versions of them, uh, or even converting video games that were on console and PC to put them on tablet. So take the game FTL, anybody's played that, for example. It's a, it's a small indie game, it's a roguelike, uh, really fantastic. Um, they converted it to iPad a couple months ago. And when you're dealing with the transition from whether it's one medium to another or one interface to another, of course there are plenty of challenges that you need to, to face and answer uh, when you're converting something from one to the next. But uh, I don't know, in general, I think it's, it's always a good thing to involve the end user in the development of the product where you can. I think we can all agree that we're building some for people that want to know how we can use it. And I also think it's helping make certain card games and board games more accessible. Uh, if you take a game like Magic the Gathering, I was a huge Magic player when it first came out, and I stopped playing like three years after. Um, I hadn't played in probably seven years and decided to pick it back up and start playing again. And the cards and deck building and, and just rules of certain cards had changed so much. I was very thankful that I could go on Steam and download a video game version of it, and now I can play it on my PC, which helped re-familiarize myself with these really complex concepts in playing the game. Also, things like uh, companion apps for games. There's a card game I love to play called Legendary, but setup is horrible on it because you have to read the rule book and figure out what characters can go with other characters. And by the time you do all that, you spend 30 minutes setting up a board and you no longer want to play the game. They have a companion app where you just say, I have three players, and it sets up all your scenarios for you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's making complicated games much more simple and more accessible. I just want to say, just want to say, we are not spokespeople for Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just so we're all aware. Okay. There's actually a, a, a board game that I like to play called Twilight Imperium. And for those, I'm sure nobody knows what the hell that is. Um, it's a, like a galactic conquest. Well, you guys know. So you guys know? <laughs> it's a galactic conquest game where you set up like a whole galaxy and you're moving like battle cruisers and stuff from one system to the next and engaging in these large scale sort of. Star Wars-esque battles and stuff, but it's incredibly complex. You're dealing with acquiring new technologies and setting up trade routes for different people. There's actually a galactic senate that convenes every round to vote on things, and which can change the rules of the game. I mean, incredibly inaccessible. Uh, you're never going to play it right the first time you play it. And I was delighted to find out there's an, there's an Android app that can you pull it up on your phone and it just keeps track of all that for you. So if you happen to have 
voted on a rule that changes the way the rounds are. You just plug it in there and it tells you everything that changes. So I think that's that's really fun and kind of it's a fun way to use multiple different media at the same time. So I think one of the big things is like I think the expansion into multiple is kind of inevitable. Uh, it takes care of a lot of problems for people. Like it's hard to make a full fledged like console game by yourself, uh, just from pure resources. But also, you need very specialized people. You need programmers and specific artists. Uh, you don't really need that so much from mobile. Uh, and it's also means I don't need to sit around and like have a bunch of cardboard at home in a board game. Um, so it's just you have all the tools. It's kind of like your own giant Lego set, and lots of people can uh, jump in and start trying to make games. Uh, Especially so many free units being available in Unity's, right? You don't have a little more than Yeah, in Unity's, like, you hit a checkbox and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so let's we'll see what my next question is. Um, so, this is more of a personal question for you guys. In what ways uh, has your education influenced your career now? You talked about that a little bit already with your background. Uh, but for the rest of you guys, and for you as well, from the head, anything else that you know, how did you get into this? Um, how, how did your past kind of influence what you do now? So I actually started off in college doing uh, computer science and psychology, and I started off with uh, artificial intelligence, but got bored with it. It's kind of ironic. Uh, but the program, the school has, has a big engineering school, so they had a lot of human factors classes, and I was just trying to take those. Um, and I was really intrigued by it. And so I followed that path and went to grad school for psychology. Uh, and while I was there, uh, one of our alumni, Randy Pavilion, who's the head of Microsoft's user research group, came by and gave this big presentation that's like, look at everything we did for Halo. Uh, I don't know how many know what Halo is, but it's fairly massive. Uh, first person shooter game, drove Xbox. So maybe off the real one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, dude. <laughs> um, but yeah, he came and gave this presentation of like, here's everything we did. And I was like, wow, that's awesome. Like, I've been a gamer since I was six. I'm a psychologist. I love science. And, uh, and I was like, these two things merge. As soon as you see it, you're like, of course, that makes perfect sense. But I never heard it before. So when I was finishing up my degree, I called up Randy and was like, I want to come work with you. And so I did. And that led me to games. Uh, I don't know that my education necessarily impacted my career choice so much as my career choice impacted my education. Okay, fair. Um, originally, I was a film major. I was a minor in interior design because I want to just you know make things and be creative. And that didn't work out very well for me. I ended up uh, working as a, uh, as a salon equipment distributor and a florist and a couple other jobs, and then decided I'm going to go back to school because I want to get back into to technology. So I started a degree as a software engineering major, decided I hate programming. <laughs> like, I, I like the control I have over programming, but once I get too in-depth into a project, I just I want to pull my hair out. It's not enjoyable to me. I, I realized early enough in my education that it wasn't right. Around that same time, I was working in the quality assurance department at Gearbox and was given an opportunity to start working in their usability department, which I totally jumped on. And I'm like, yes, I don't want to test games anymore either. I'm bored. And I was still a college student at the time, and that's when I decided to make the transfer from computer engineering to taking a bunch of psychology courses and just taking classes that I thought would benefit what I was currently doing. And it's kind of the opposite way for me. Uh, so, yeah. Um Undergraduate, I was a psychology major. Um, just got into research pretty early on. Went to grad school for cognitive science. Um, spent the majority of my time working in a virtual reality lab, uh, looking at kind of developing models of uh, human locomotor behavior. So how do we chase things? How do we avoid things? Um, my best friend in grad school had a human backwards background. Talked to him quite a bit, a lot about various things. So attended a talk by Don Norman. He came to the university. Um, and took a couple classes in you know, computational behavioral science and psychology. Uh, learned pretty quickly that I didn't want to go the academic route. Um, and uh, ended up working after grad school with the US Army at a, a research facility outside of Boston for a couple of years, where I did a lot of field work, uh, working with soldiers and vehicles and displays, and kind of got my head around the kind of 
group led, so sorry, uh, kind of group studies as opposed to working with individuals, which I had done for years and years up until that point. And also learn a little bit more about just general usability and user research testing. Uh, and then opportunity came when Stephanie uh, went from Gearbox to ID and the position became vacant, which around the same time I was looking for something different. Uh, and ended up where I am now. And for those of you interested, um, I also went the same route as you, Stephanie, in that I started out as computer science. About a year into it, I realized this is going to be my life, and I don't know if I can handle that. So I ended up switching to a degree offered at UT Dallas called Arts and Technology, which was, uh, it, it's a blanket statement for all kinds of design, things like that. And my focus was on video game design. And so I just wanted to work in the video game industry. Um, when I heard that there was a position open as a, a playtest intern, I'm like, I don't know what that means, but it's at Gearbox and I like their game, so let's try it out. Um, I ended up not quite working out, but I actually liked that usability side of things. Like, that's pretty fun. So I started looking and ended up uh, at Saber where I am now. So, okay, uh, let's see. So for people who are interested in learning more about games user research, game mechanics, game design, things like that, what sort of resources are available to them? Things like books, sites, stuff like that. I know for me one of my favorite resources is just looking at what other games have done within user research. Um, Halo is a great game. Cues is an example for this as well. They publish a ton of their studies. They show heat maps and how they've actually made decisions based on user feedback and data collected from within the game. So a lot of times if I'm stumped and I don't know like what methodology I should do, with or how to approach testing something new, I look at what other companies have done. And I know in, in the video game industry recently, it's, it's become a lot more open with what we can talk about within usability. That's typically not the case. Artists, programmers, designers, they don't talk amongst each other. But within our, within our usability group, a lot of times, we don't share confidential information, but we can share examples of how we've applied methodologies. And that's very common to find with game companies now. We even have a user research group at the Game, the game Developers Conference, GPC. Uh, it's the day before GPC proper. Um, but it's a, an all day conference with talks, panels, posters, you name it. So it's, it's a really great resource, and if any of that gets published out, that's also really, really good. And not that selling like a total smart house, but play games. Um, honestly, playing games with a critical eye, kind of thinking about what you're doing, and, and it's not necessarily self narrating, but you know. Kind of running an internal monologue about, okay, what is this feature? How, why am I having trouble with this? Kind of putting yourself in that position and that perspective while playing a game. Kind of gets you thinking about these issues and what other end users might be thinking. Um, stepping outside, of, if you are a gamer, if you play a lot of video games, or you play a lot of any kind of game, kind of stepping outside of that for a moment and, and looking at it from perhaps the perspective of a naive user. Teach a game to somebody. You learn a lot from teaching somebody how to play something. What works, what doesn't work. Yeah, I think there's a lot of resources available, like, like yourself, that's things at gsuresearch.com. They have like a ton of their stuff published. Uh, there's a game analytics book for mm -hmm. telemetry and kind of reporting data on the back end. Um, I know there's another book that I'm, I think, like, Patrick is Mister, that I'm totally blanking on the name of. Um, <coughs> so there are some of the books you can get, of course, like you know, stuff for using the side of things. Um, and then for us, like we get together once a month to just go grab drinks, hang out, talk about kind of methodology issues, whatever, like how do I answer this type of question, uh, you know, without actually breaking our NDAs in any way. Uh, I think it's hard. Sometimes it is hard. But, Especially uh, when you start drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but if, regardless of the type of game you're developing, some of the core questions you're going to try to answer are going to be the same regardless of platform, whether it's a tabletop game or a video game, you know, whether it's a first person shooter or a stealth horror game or you name it. It's all about how is the user approaching this problem? How are they interpreting what's on the screen at any given time? How are they problem solving? You know, they're all very fundamental questions about how people approach problems. Which is something I'd say would apply beyond people. Oh, you yeah. handle it. You know, when I'm dealing with the tool that travel agents use, it's the same kind of stuff. Are they comprehending what's going on the screen? You know, how do they understand the paradigm of what's going on that kind of stuff? So. Yeah, it's all the same motivating factors. Who do you motivate people? And 
people in real life. There's no difference in the psychology behind it, really. Both ways. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Completely both points are here. Yeah. 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 Um, so what are some applications of gaming and games user research in other types of user experiences? And I want some of the examples I gave you guys for things like gamification, stuff like that. Uh, so working at a university, one of the places we've been using the core is actually teaching apps. Okay. Um, and particularly like making, like, you know, there's been a long history of like making things that are kind of game-ish that are supposed to teach people stuff. Uh, we've been working on really making actual games, like things that are fun and that people want to with that we're also teaching. So we had a project we were working on um, basically alongside the military for they have uh, this group called forward air controllers. They're basically the spotters. Right? So they'll call in like, hey, you know, artillery strike over here, I need a drone strike over there. Um, but the training for that is crazy expensive. Uh, something in excess of like a quarter of a million dollars per person. Uh, in part because they have to bring in like live aircraft and live artillery and those stuff up. Um, so we made a game that's very similar to uh, you know, real-time strategy games, which is a whole genre of video games, uh, in which people can basically do all the necessary steps that they need to do. We created what were real-world scenarios. Um, but you make a game, it's actually five people engaged to do all the basic stuff, and hopefully it shortens a lot of the training time, takes up some time pause. Uh, and at the end of the day, it didn't cost us much to build it, and it cost as much to, you know, for someone to buy it, um, and certainly not anything really significant on the scale of two hundred fifty thousand dollars per person. Yeah. Uh, so that's one of the images is teaching apps producing similar with the biology professors. Uh, they're trying to teach people protein folding, which is basically like how you fight cancer, uh, but normally doing protein folding like most med students don't actually understand it. They memorize like here's some rules. They don't really know what's going on. So we're just making a basic visualization app where you can play with you know various styles like pH levels and temperature and whatever, and just see how this thing plays out. Uh, and of course, the classic game fashion would cheat the whole system because otherwise we need like super computers running it. Yeah. But that's what you need to do. To cheat. It's all simulation. Yeah, absolutely. I think mean, education is a good, good point to mention. I forget who. There's a, a quote that I really loved here, and I forget who said it, but it was something along the lines of every video game ever made is educational, because at the very least it has to teach you how to play it. So, I mean, when you're enjoying yourself, you're retaining so much more information, and, and that's something that we need to start utilizing. So. There's, a, there's a really great uh, idea that uh, there's a woman named Jay McGonagall, who works out in California, against one of the future. She's a big proponent of gamification and, and games research. And she said, to the, that's from what we just mentioned, that the, the average person, the average gamer, spends about 10,000 hours uh, playing video games between the ages of 5 and 18. And the, that same person spends about 10,000 hours in the formal education. Theater. So you're actually getting a parallel education as you grow up playing video games uh, that can actually be leveraged to solve a lot of that real problems. So you're learning a lot of things how to work with others, how to solve problems that are very abstract in nature, how to you know, do multi-step thinking and so on and so forth. Um, you know, other, other good principles I think um, that you can apply for video games research to other kinds of usability is like um, reward structures, uh, transparency of goals, uh, finding that fine line between tutorializing somebody and allowing for discovery. That's one of the more difficult things. You know, oftentimes when we're working with developers and here are what we need to teach players from the get-go. Because developers, as they're making the game, want to always think about well, what does the person need to learn at the beginning? Because they're the ones making the game very close to the product. So they may make assumptions that are not that correct. They may assume, oh, this person's played like 25 first person shooter games before. They know how to use basic controls from that FPS game. But what if it's their first game? What if it, what if it's Jimmy's first, you know, Xbox Christmas game, whatever? So we have to actually teach some of those things, but you also have to allow for the player to, to discover features and mechanics, because that's rewarding in and of itself. So giving them just enough to get them bootstrapped into the game without force feeding them, because gamers need nothing more than being force-fed information uh, that they would rather discover themselves. So kind of like a 
text box that pops up and says, I'm going to explain to you all these stand mechanics, and you're like, no, I want to play. Go away. All right, so those are the questions I have. Um, let's go ahead and open it up. Uh, I'm sure you guys have at least some questions. All right, so um, why don't we start here? That was actually, you You almost answered my question. Uh, I was going to ask, um, so in traditional software, right, it, the goal is, generally speaking, no tutorial, right? They should be able to launch your website and there's no discovery. It should be painfully obvious exactly what they need to do. There's this, you know, call to action. There's the funnel to get them to do what they need to do. There's a, a flow. Uh, games, if there, if you did that, they would hate it, right? There's this notion of having to. You need to discover. That's part of the fun. So, my question really is, what are the kind of things that you guys do? Because I imagine a lot of that onus falls on you. Where deciding where that line is, where you cross the line from fun to discover versus painful to discover versus painfully obvious. Because you know, anyway, so I don't think there is any like magic on that one. Uh, I'd say one of the things that I've seen is usually the tutorials like the last thing they build, which means you've already put a ton of people in front of the thing and seen what they'll figure out on their own and what they won't. And so I usually have this list of like here's the ten things I gotta tell people before they can play your game anyways. And then they know like they gotta put those ten things in the tutorial and hopefully not make the tutorial all that stuff. Uh, which is also a challenge. But yeah, I think it changes from game to game. Yeah, there's a yeah, there's two things that I typically like to recommend to teams to, to give them freedom to allow players to make choices on that. If someone feels they're proficient enough with shooters that they don't need to see the tutorial. Put a checkbox that turns tutorial prompts off. That way you're not getting spammed with button prompts. The user can make the decision then to go in and do I need to learn this stuff or do I need to take it out because I just I want to play and discover on my own. Uh, it's something else that, that we try to recommend to developers is uh, loading screens. Players do nothing but stare blankly at a loading screen when it's going. So put a tool tip, put a reminder. If you know people struggle with remembering um, for example, in Gears of War, there's a mechanic where you can tap the button at the right time when you're reloading your weapon and it gives you a damage bonus. They put a reminder on loading screens that says, if you tap the button at this right time, it'll do this. So putting that reminder is just a, you know, a small feature that is always there that can nudge players towards rediscovering a feature you may have taught them you know, one or more times already. Uh, beyond that, with certain features that are like unique or using product to certain games, giving players a heads up or, or some kind of early game awareness of that feature, um, and then allowing them to experience it either firsthand or giving them the opportunity to play with it. Um, and portal is, is, I think, one of the best examples of how to provide players all of the tools they need to solve the problems in each of the puzzles in the game. Um, so Portal is for folks who don't know, it's uh, not only a puzzle game, and, and the big stick of the game is that you have uh, a gun, a portal gun, that you can use to create portals in space. So if you're solving all these problems using like non creation space, geometry, and play it, it's lots of fun. Um, but they give you all the tools you need right in front of you. So they aren't hiding anything, but they're allowing you to use, you know, deductive reasoning essentially to, to figure out how to put those pieces together. Um, I think uh, it's. I was actually going to bring up Portal if you didn't. So um, yeah. one of the things I like about Portal is that nearly half of that game is tutorial. Yes. Um, Spoilers. Yeah, yeah. And for those of you who care, um, but but you don't feel like it is because you feel like you're just going through. And because the way that they do it, um, like John said, they they give you all the stuff up front, but they start easing you into more difficult puzzles that require a little bit more, you know, so the first one you just maybe need to put a portal here, put a portal there, and walk through it, and you're done. But maybe the next puzzle you just gotta start playing with physics a little bit, you know, and you gotta start like throwing things through one box, and it, or through one portal, and it comes out somewhere else. And so they, they, they very gradually start uh, giving you more and more complex puzzles, so you can start building off of what you learned in the last one, and start trying to to understand 
some pretty complex concepts that, that you wouldn't expect average gamers to really grab onto. So I'm sorry, I thought I think I saw your hand first, and then we'll go to you. Uh, so are you able to do any kind of useful user testing with prototypes, or do you really need to have a full fidelity game going in order to get the wild results? Prototypes. It's not like that. Yeah. Um, Earlier, better. Yeah. Uh, so I, we usually break down our testing to usability testing, point testing, usability testing really being the functional side of things to be able to figure out how to do it. Uh, play testing is kind of like you don't want to do this. Um, you can easily, like for prototypes, uh, we'll do like a danger room, like X Men style, of, like just keep spawning bad guys and you like, like play with the combat, see if that's fun. Uh, we can even play test uh, storyboards for your story. So instead of set up like a comic strip on a wall, just be like basically presenting chunks to people and see if they can follow what's going on. If they like it, if they hit what they're like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, why would someone do that? Um, We've done mockups in web browsers for user interface and menu flows to see if yeah. it makes sense, if people can interact with it. And the benefit of doing something like that, a lot of times you can have the uh, Xbox or the PlayStation controller interface with the PC and actually move within the browser. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have two questions. Sure. Um, the uh, first question is, when it comes to like the uh, quantitative side of user uh, user research, uh, do you use like uh, tools like what are the most common tools you use? Like any like uh, statistical software like R or um, any that are SAS or SPSS? Um, so yeah, I, I grew up using SPSS. Um, SPSS is great. Uh, honestly, Excel is fantastic for a lot of little things. I mean, unless you're, you're running like massive analyses that don't actually require SPSS, uh, Excel can do quite a bit. Um, in terms of data visualization, Tableau is also really, really useful. Um, you know, of course, as everybody knows, different software has different strengths and limitations, and figuring out the right tools for the job is always great. Um, but yeah, I you know. It, Looking at the quantitative aspect of user research, you've got the kind of quantitative metrics that you can collect from players, which are often self reported and highly subjective in nature. So I always take that with a grain of salt from this. You know, never, never run the wrong analysis on that because you can vastly misinterpret the data. Uh, but then you can also get data from games, from the back, you know, from the back end of games, so to speak, um, which you can tend to run more traditional you know, statistical analysis on. And a lot of engines now have plugins that you can yeah. use to generate key maps and other visualizations within the game engine. Yeah. Of course, you know, as everybody knows, when it comes to, to data of any kind, conversion results is always useful. So if, you're, if the game is telling you the same thing that the players are telling you, that's usually a good sign. It's where there's a disconnect where you know the player says, oh man, this thing was really, really easy. I breezed right through it, but they died like 19 times. What's happening there? Those are actually where the most interesting question lies that intersection between player feedback and game data and where that breaks down. My other question is, um, so I was looking at a lot of uh, like uh, like all those uh, job postings for like user experience researchers and I noticed that you know they always want like uh, n number of years of experience. Uh, how does one actually get the uh, get that experience? Like would uh, the experience in uh, like uh, uh, research in like within like uh, university level like masters or, or PhD help or like really hope that counts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what the hell was I doing for ten years? Um, yeah, I mean, it, yes. Yeah. What was I doing ten years? <laughs> We're delving into philosophical stuff. Right yeah, the answer to that. <laughs> so usually they require some kind of advanced degree. Uh, masters uh, is usually kind of minimum. Uh, PhD, sometimes being preferred depending on the group. Uh, and then they'll have some X number of years of experience. A lot of times experience in other industries can carry over because when they don't want to see, you can like run an unbiased study and get used to that. Uh, the other answer is a lot of the particularly bigger places will do things like contractors and vendors. Uh, so like I know since I started Microsoft doing this very thing, like they have vendors who are basically full-fledged researchers. Uh, and the only thing you didn't do was essentially you weren't point of contact for the team. And so you get your several years of experience running tests and just constantly, like you get the requirements, you run the test, you analyze you know, 
analyze the data, put together a report, hand it off to someone else, and it goes back to the team. You just keep doing that. Um, so that's another way to get the like years of industry experience to get in. And you can also create your own positions. I mean, if you've got a little bit of experience doing some user studies and you want to expand, approach indie companies or startups. People who have very little budget and no experience or resources to do that on their own, because they'll take something over nothing. And if you've done one study, that's better than the programmer who's done zero studies. Yeah, and I can tell you, I know there's at least I think three, probably more smaller studios even like right in this area, like a very short five minute drive from where we are now, uh, that don't have a user research group that have talked to like us at SMU about whether or not we can do it for them. And so if you call them say like, hey, you know, I'm doing user research for this other industry, I'm interested in getting into games, let me try it out, but can I work with you? I'll do it, you know, do it for free or do it for a very small amount. Uh, they'd be more than happy to. I've run tests in a Starbucks, like it's easy enough to do. And you say on Starbucks would be like free copy and you play a video game. And like there's a line. <laughs> it might be the free copy, but <laughs> one other thing I'll add to that is a lot of times when a, a job posting says something like two years minimum experience, um, that's really more of a, a guideline than a hard rule that they're gonna stick to hundred um, percent. just uh, with my own personal experience, I'm pretty sure the the job that I have now at Sabre, it said something like three years experience. I didn't have three years experience. I still barely have that much at this point. Um, but it, you know, they're going to look at you more holistically. They're going to be looking at your previous works, you know, your portfolio if you've got one, which you should probably have, a, you know, a portfolio or something like that. Um, you know, they're going to look at other things that you do. So if you don't necessarily hit that one checkbox, that's not like that doesn't necessarily mean you're instantly going to be. Out. So yeah. there's also the, the specific field they may be looking for. So game user research is a fairly young industry. You know, I think as Stephanie said, it is only now beginning to crop up in a lot of smaller independent studios. Um, yeah, they may say they want somebody with human factors or psychology, but if you've got a sociology background or an anthropology background, that doesn't mean you're not qualified for the job. And I think there are so many different ways you can attack some problems of user research. Um, you, know, you may bring something to the table that you know, somebody with a background in experimental psychology may never really think of. So consider it from that regard as well. Because, like Josh said, they're going to value it holistically, but also consider that the types of research that you've done in your particular field that may not be directly related to game user research, but could have an impact on your perspective. I'd say also, uh, if you've got to go back to what Josh said about a portfolio, if you're not in games, it's actually probably one of the biggest advantages you can have. Most of us in games can't actually have one. Like, I can't show someone, here's what Halo looked like before I worked on it, and here's what it looked like after. Uh, I would end up like buried under lawyers. But for you guys who are working on things like websites or mobile apps that are public or where your company's okay with it, you can show here's a before and after and really walk people through, like, here's the impact I had. Um, once you're in the games industry, that's incredibly difficult to ever be able to do. Um, I literally did not have a single thing I could put on a portfolio and say, here's a before and after shot. Um, Five. All right. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So, um, Halo 3 has that engine in it that has all the metrics and the heat maps about how you play. Uh, a couple of years, a year after that, Call of Duty had something like that. Are we going to see more of those types of features in games? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Uh, it's actually probably in a lot more games than you know. Uh, yeah, so just public about it. Yeah, like Halo and Call of Duty put out all these cool infographics and they'll be like, look, more people will be able to follow up and remember actually lived on Earth. Um, <laughs> For other games, like I know I've worked on a variety of games uh, that are always collecting that data on the back end. When you get that initial like splash screen, there's like this roll of text. And one of the things it says is like, we're collecting data. If you don't want to collect data, don't play the game. Uh, and they are collecting the data. And usually, you know, if it's not something like a wow or they might just really be constantly updating, they're using that to inform their decisions for the next game. Uh, and so like, you know, if you look at like Saints Row Coalition, right? They've got many presentations on the data. Well, that is Saints Row 3, but then one we did Saints Row 4, as far as how people use their world and what they do there. 
how they use different objects that are around. Um, you know, it's all about really being able to make informed choices. So I, I would not be at all surprised to see if in some time in the near future, like everything has it. I think right now the only thing that stops people is having programmer time to build the system and having the infrastructure in which to collect the data. Uh, so I know like Saints really said they've got like six terabytes of data or something crazy. Uh, maybe it'll collect processing all of that too. There are other games now, these are also starting to incorporate feedback directly into feedback. So Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag allows you to break the mission you just did. Uh, now of course it's, it's kind of a simplistic rate of five stars, but it's a start. Uh, it's allowing users to provide direct feedback to the developers as they play through the content. So seeing more and more of that, again, it's all that transparency and relationship between the developers and the end user that more and more people are creating. I think you had, yeah. Yeah, uh, do you guys still use, do you videotape the players actually testing the game and they go back and review the film to see what they, how they reacted to certain things and is that still very common? Okay. Yeah, but we'll leave it sound like a purpose for some of our video. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we recently decided that, oh, uh, while we're testing people within, we've got some really good scare reactions, and we have people sign consent forms so we can use their videos not only for development purposes, but there's a whole series of people just screaming while playing the game that's available on YouTube for marketing purposes as well. Like yeah, yeah. 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 Now, one more question, too. Do you guys. Uh, Test the achievements. So, like a lot of console games, give out achievements to see what the players' reaction are to that one achievement, and they go, eh, whatever, or they get one and say, yeah, it's the one I always wanted. Or, do you have any feedback loop into that process? Yeah, achievement yeah. names have changed or come out of play tests. Um, even achievement thresholds, like we've discovered through play testing, you know, one percent of the five hundred people who played our game can actually do this within sixty hours of gameplay. That should be an achievement. Right. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I would agree there. Good then know, fine tuning those requirements and the payoff for achievements. It is something that we're very good at. Also, sure. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think about like really simple games, but like tremendous, tremendous and successful games like you know, Angry Bird and Happy Bird and Candy Crush Saga? And how would you guys explain that they're, I guess, a factor for success? And then why is it so hard that the other companies like, it can imitate the same thing but can still kind of do it? I guess that's in terms of like, user experience, I guess. I was start by saying I don't think complexity is a requirement for it to be fun. Uh, you know, they have like all three of those games which just have a very basic kind of reward structure built into it. There's, as a psychologist, my cat's kind of like really just gonna rats pushing them. Yeah. Yeah, just get a box. Candy um, Crush is great because it's so brightly colored, it's accessible, it's on Facebook so everybody can use it. Yeah. My grandma plays Candy Crush. Right. And then your friends all start applying social pressure on you whenever they're like, I need stuff. <laughs> Give me <laughs> lives. <laughs> Angry Birds is great because you have that direct tactile feedback on your iPhone and the bird back and let go. You see exactly what happens. So there's that immediacy of reward from that set. So I, so I just use big bikes like cars. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Under a candy crush or halo, it's the same yes. motivation. I also like to just throw in there that um, we were talking before about uh, onboarding and, and teaching people new. Uh, Angry Birds is actually another, I guess, pretty good example of that. Where it's like, you know, you start out and you just got the little red bird that just doesn't do anything special. After a couple levels, they throw in the little triangle bird, and that one works a little bit differently. And they'll, you know, they'll just show you like one little picture, and then it's like, go for it, try it out, see what happens. And then there's no, uh, there's no punishment for failure, so you can kind of just experiment, see how it responds to your touches. Uh, it, it really uh, encourages exploration and discovery. So. Uh, Going. Have you done anything with uh, gambling, like the video, video games in uh, Vegas? I, I went last year, I was amazed, I'd sit and watch people play, and I saw like, all these intrinsic rewards where they weren't winning money, but they would have some cool new feature in the game if they played to a certain level and they get this new thing. Have you done anything with that? Or? 
you speak to that? The closest thing I've had experience with that is there is a vending machine. They have yeah, slot machines, machines in Borderlands. Yeah. Yeah. There's a slot machine where there's a chance that you know you'll get an awesome gun, a super crappy gun, or a grenade will pop out and blow you up. <laughs> Finding you know, any game that has um, currency, game currency that after you play for hundreds of hours, you have a mass amount of it. Finding ways for players to to sync that currency to something we just call it currency sinks is useful because the players put rewarded for spending that amount of time playing the game. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously in Vegas they want people to keep playing. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. So like, uh, there's a game I've been playing recently, and I haven't even thought of that. I haven't even made that connection with it, but there's a uh, Marvel Puzzle Quest on Android I've been playing, and they have two different types of currencies, and you can uh, just kind of throw away one of your currencies and gamble to see if you get a certain level of character with it, and I will sit there and play that game for hours, just trying to get to the you know, next level of currency so I can buy that one card, hoping it's the character I need. Because I bet those slot machine owners, slot machine companies pay their testers really well. Oh goodness, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> Casino psychology is like its own whole. Yeah. But I'm seeing more of the video. I'm seeing more of the video game rewards, like I said, intrinsic versus yeah. instead of just giving them yeah. giving them money back. I would argue there's probably uh, levels of, of gambling within really any sort of game. Yeah, I saw you with that. Well, I'm just I'm curious about the kind of the generational thing and the culture. You know, gaming has been around for about 20 years now, and it's changed, and now we have the audience now like has grown up with it. So, what what changes have you seen or are you seeing take place now? Uh, and kind of in the audience, I guess, of, of, of gamers. Anything stand out? Um, well, so I've been doing this for about two years now, so I'm confident I've been having gaming courses like I've been playing around the panel since I was a kid. Um, you know, of course, the, the crowd may seem to be seeing younger because um, people are now growing up and playing games, so of course. You know, if, if you become proficient early on in life just through exposure and, and you know, playing video games, you're, you're going to be better as an adult. Right? Just um, expectations, uh, we've noticed, since change um, because of the internet, which of course was not a thing when I first started playing Nintendo back in 1989. Um, players have an unprecedented level of access to stories about games. Um, Information about games. You know, the World of Warcraft archive has more pages than any other wiki in the world, or something. Mm -hmm. um, so information can transfer very quickly. Communities can grow very quickly because of the expectations can change. Um, players may have a higher, you know, they may set a higher bar for the quality of uh, the game breadth um, as a result. So you know, and also to that that extent, um, you know. Dovetailing it back into user research, there may be features that we discover that don't crop up until fairly late in the game's development. And of course, as everybody knows, you know, games, because they're so complex, there comes a point where you just can't make any more changes. You kind of have to ship the damn thing. Uh, when that happens, we can uh, not often say this, but on occasion, think, well, the nice part about this is, you know, we can message this. Marketing can message that this might be an issue or this might be particularly difficult, but at the same time, the user base is going to find this out and disseminate that information on forums, on websites, very, very quickly. You know, Walkthroughs for games crop up within 24 hours of the game's release. So, to some extent, we can leverage the community and their their, their hunger for this content uh, to help us you know, message certain things. Yeah, I think the connectedness is probably the main thing that's changed. Uh, you know, you have like uh, for Assassin's Creed 4, you can get an app that you can play on your phone or your tablet, so you can basically be playing Assassin's Creed no matter where you are instead of just being at home. Um, but as far as most of the other changes, I don't know how much they're driven by kind of age change or generational change versus just like tech. Like we're able to do more things now than we could. Um, so I think that's probably one of the big drivers there. I know there's definitely it's the other way around. Gaming has had a big effect on the generation. I, mean, I, I think about places I visited when I was a kid, you know, real places. And my son talks about places that you know, some, it's 25, and 
I'm still talking about some place who does a video game software. Oh, this is like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the one of the other points I think that's important to realize though is like your average gamer is like 34 years old now. You know, even in studios that I work with, a lot of times you'll still find people I think who are aiming at like the 18 to 21 year old like boys. And I'm like, you know, like, first the average gamer is 34, and depending on what industry you're looking at, like, there are subsets that are vastly more women than there are men. Um, yeah. And I think overall it's about 50 50 now. Yeah. Rock and roll fans will all want to see more of your I actually think I have a, I have some unique insight because of the difference in age with me and my brother. Uh, there's 15 years difference in us, and I grew up playing games, he grew up playing games. His expectations in games are much different than mine. I'm okay if a game doesn't have a waypoint that guides me from the spot I'm at right now to my next objective, to the next micro objective, to the next thing I need to walk up to. Whereas my brother and his friends, they'll play older games, and like, where's the option for my waypoint? Where's, how come your, this feature's not in the game? And a lot of those features, I think, have evolved because of of our generation and how we changed as gamers. Because when I was 10, I had all the time in the world to sit there and try to figure out where to go to Zelda. You know, I could draw on a graph paper and make my own maps. As an adult with a job, I can't do that. I've got about an hour, hour and a half to play games every night. So it's given the choice of like a free roaming open world game with very little player guidance, or a game that has had a lot of usability testing, it's a very fluid, cohesive experience that I'm not going to be frustrated and confused on. I'm going to go with the not frustrated and confused option. Basically, all of us up here suffered through the original Ninja Turtles game for Nintendo. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, the kids nowadays know that. Uh, yeah, seriously. Right? <laughs> it's a sticking point for everybody. Yeah. Uh, are you guys seeing any um, versions of like real time testing? Because now there's so many ways there's cameras, there's mics on consoles. Like anybody having that kind of just turned on and seeing you know, whether they're digging in or their heart rate is, is increasing. Uh, so I think the closest that I've really gotten with that is we'll have teams watching like a usability test in real time, seeing the issues that come up and just immediately start fixing it. it doesn't go into the version the person's playing, because that would just totally break things as they're going. Uh, but I could easily have a new version of the game for the next participant, or at least the next day. Uh, but it's usually, that's usually more on the functional side of things. Uh, you know, like I said, we've been moving away, I think, a lot from biometrics, so things like heart rate and that kind of stuff uh, is particularly uh, endorsed. And I, mean, I guess the leaning in. Maybe that would be prior. That's always so subjective. Like I know lots of developers that kind of like it, but only pay attention to it when it's actually helping their cause. Yeah, you know, sometimes people talk about, oh, if you look like people are excited or, or have that kind of look of interest on their face, we tend to say, well, have you ever watched gamers play games? You know, the term gamer face is a thing, right? Yeah. Stephanie's so, actually a great example of this. Had a ton of kind of. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so let's we'll start to ever do a marketing demo game. <laughs> yeah. So like you know, several responses. You know, you mentioned people with that, right? Several responses are great because that, that that's you know parasympathetic. You're not going to be able to get away from that. Um, you know, we we've had scare responses in games. Um, Laughter is always good. You know, these things that, that you attend to be humorous, they come across as humorous. Are pretty apparent. Um, you know, like that's we've had situations where developers are watching like a boss fight. And they see, oh, oh crap, that's not working correctly. And they'll run off and get it ready for the next test. Mm -hmm. um, that's the major advantage of having developers go alongside you for that particular user test. Um, sometimes it, it's not it's not uh, appropriate or feasible for them to be in the room. But you know, if and when you can have them have those major stakeholders in the test present to observe firsthand, you still want to give them the, the process data afterwards as well. To, you know, Help, uh, help with their understanding of things, but that initial reaction is great. Yeah. Well, real time in terms of like, more, like more games are becoming um, more complex, like taking on issues of um, gender definition, uh, you know, moral choice, like, like referenced earlier, or um, just sexual orientation, like how much testing or research is done, you know, those kind of areas. I mean, I think we can test and ask kind of any questions that developers really have. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I guess I'm not sure exactly about the real time. Like, I don't think there's any game that I know where it's like in people's houses and they're playing it and they're just like changing it as they play. Yeah. 
Um, it's just there's coding and setting up different nodes and all that kind of like, there's just that stuff in the back and it doesn't make that kind of unusable. But the thing you always have to understand is we're, we're, we're part of a very large development production cycle. So we always have to work within the constraints of what production can deal with. So even if you say, hey, this thing really should be changed for tomorrow morning's user test, um, the producers will say, well, actually, we're waiting on these four other changes. We will be kick off with a new build and a new version of the game because if we kick one off now, then the build machine won't be ready for these other four things we're ready to go in, and that's also really important. So whether it means delaying the user test today or just saying, okay, cool, cool. So my question was, uh, where do you see like this gaming industry intersecting with the other fields? Like for example, just a few weeks back, uh, I was just uh, downloading apps for habit tracking and goal tracking, and one of the apps was like a fantasy player game where like you design a goal, and if you fulfill that goal, you get some point or XP, and then it's kind of just like a game, so it like forces you to be more active, fulfilling your goals, being managing your time better. So that was a very unique intersection of the gaming industry and like normal day-to-day -day product. So I just wanted your take on where do you see that intersection happening more? I have a bunch of things that right on me right now, and they have tons of gamification elements on that too. You get, you get achievements, you get these little bars that go up and tell you, you know, that kind of, yeah. Yeah, I, I use my fitness pal, and when I'm tracking my food, it's like, oh, you had coffee from Starbucks this morning, that's a great source of calcium. And then it yells at me saying, oh, you had too much sodium, don't do that. Mm. I think it's great that the different technologies and are learning from each other. I know if, if gamification had been applied to like the programs that I was using for homework in school, I would have studied much more. <laughs> I think there's lots of things that we have to do in life that we don't really like doing, and games can help shed some light on how to make those enjoyable and keep people driving towards it. So whether it's fitness stuff that you were talking about or you know, really anything else. It was, uh, there's actually a dice talk. Um, I think Jesse Shell, I'll say 2010, where he talks about the idea of gamer bot basically all of your life and being like, oh, you brush your teeth, Colgate gives you 20,000 points. Uh, and you get enough points, they'll just send you free toothpaste or something. Uh, there was a few ways on, but I don't think you're just going to watch it. There was a, a Penny Arcade strip, I don't know, maybe a year ago, where it was King Sisyphus, right, in the other world, pushing the rock up the hill. And he said, all right, well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to push this rock up the hill, and it's going to fall back down, and you're going to do it again. Oh crap, I don't want to do that. I said, but hey, actually, what if we give you an experience point each time you do it? It's like, oh, sweet. Like, you know, <laughs> like, said, like, there are a lot of things in life that we just don't want to do, but if, it, if you gamify it a little bit, you can provide a reward structure. Again, that's what we talked about before. Kind of transparency of rewards and, and allowing players to discover things. Um, you know, and as Jesus says, like, you're discovering stuff in life. Why not reward players to do it? Um, I think it's interesting that you brought up, you know, eventually we could kind of gamify everything. I think for some of us, we already kind of do that on our own. Like, I don't know about you guys, but that's just the way I think. I think it's probably because I grew up playing these games. It's like, I may not be actually writing down points that I'm giving myself because that would be sad. But, you know, something along those lines where I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm giving myself that sort of internal feedback and sort of, you know, congratulating myself on doing whatever. It's, it's almost just an external version of that. Uh, was um, actually a pretty interesting uh, TED talk on Netflix. I think it was by the same lady you mentioned earlier, Jane. Got Jane got got mm -hmm. Yeah, she was talking, you know, she had a real life situation. She suffered from a concussion, and that recovery process was just slow for her. It wasn't really happening. So she turned it into a game. And she started playing that game with her husband every day and her sister, and she got them all involved, and they turned it into a big game. That actually sped up the recovery. It's a lot easier, so it's pretty, pretty good. Yeah, and most of the things, that, anything that you engage in takes a long time, whether it's recovering from some kind of injury or fitness stuff, usually the problem is you don't have rewards, so we stop wanting to do them. And really all gamifying this is adding a reward structure. And more immediate rewards. Yeah, right? Right? Intermediate yeah. rewards. Because exactly. eventually with fitness you're going to get rewards, but you have to be really <laughs> patient with it. So if I'm getting a little Flips on my phone going, hey, you got 10,000 steps, good job. I mean, that's far more immediate than, than having to 
continue doing it for six months and hope it's okay with that. I thought gamers were really patient. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So you left the games industry. Yes. So we, did, we just talked about all the awesomeness that is there and how we can apply that outside. So what made you make the leap from what most people would consider the destination mm -hmm. to, oh, it was Brian, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it just has to work with Brian. Um, well, part of it was I, I think that just sort of on a personal level, um, I, I don't know how well I meshed with that industry, but um, part of it also is, I mean, we need people in other industries who understand, I mean, I've been able to take my understanding of gamification and things like that, and actually one of the first projects I worked on when I was brought on board was uh, uh, this one product of ours that I, I started suggesting gamification uh, you know, elements, and they ended up, I think they implemented them, I don't know, I should probably check them. Sure, but um, <laughs> they, they really liked the suggestions and elements, I don't know, at the time they thought they were great. So, um, but I, I think that, uh, that was one of my strengths when I applied for the job and when I interviewed and stuff was I brought a, a perspective that the department didn't have yet. And I think they were they were looking for something like that or that. Or I like Chris liked your name. Yeah, well, that's that too. I actually offered the letter of question. She yeah. said no. I'm like, okay, I get it. Okay. But yeah, I think for me, I just, um, I, I, I enjoy the usability side of things. Um, like that's my main, at this point my main interest is usability. And whether that's usability of a video game or a, you know, an airline looking engine, I don't know. That's what I enjoy doing. So. He had a, Brandon, he had a really good interview and he talked about the uh, psychology aspects between playtest and usability and matched up really well. And uh, we gave him a test that I would call it my name. And uh, he did fantastic. He passed with flying colors. Uh, we gave him a pat on the back. And she made me even more curious on like Taco Bell's website. Yeah, or the worst there? website ever. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah, something like that. So yeah, it was really a mind game. But he, he did great. He conquered the best. Following up on something Josh said about the uh, culture. I like working weird long hours and not having a social life for free time, so I'm totally cool with these 80 hour work weeks for six, seven months straight because I do that and I'm fine with it. A lot of people I know leave the game industry because they want more time for family or personal projects. Um, I know one thing with us is we're not allowed to have side projects at our company because we could be creating things using company secrets or resources, so to avoid that, just go side projects. I've got a couple friends that got out of the games industry so they could do things they wanted to pursue in their own time, even if it's not game related. Uh, writing a book, writing a blog, doing journalism, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think the hours are something you usually see, particularly on the user research side, because we've had to test nights and weekends, because you know, otherwise your target audience is at work. Yeah. Um, which means you're working nights and weekends a lot. Uh, you know, I get to sleep in and go in late, which is great, but oh, the rest of the world, um, <laughs> yeah, there's that. Those guys go in late too. Um, so yeah, I think the hours tends to be a big thing. Uh, personality fit, like if you're one, if you're a type of person who really likes the like, I'm in a suit and everything's like you know rigid, whatever. Like games is not where you want to be. Uh, I think our average maturity age is around 13. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, you're lucky if your programmers keep their pants on. <laughs> <laughs> there were certain things about the culture I really liked. Um, like the, one of the things I mean, you go into anybody's office, it's just filled with toys. I mean, there's like Legos, there's Nerf guns, there's all kinds of just crazy fun stuff everywhere. There's scotch. Um, yes, it will bring to work. Yeah. yeah. So there are certainly it has its advantages, but yeah, I would say the hours are a big thing. Um, yeah. There's also uh, on the pay side, uh, honestly, there's some people who want into the games industry relative to the number of spots that the pay is more than you elsewhere. Uh, for mm -hmm. most fields, like for 
for most disciplines, whatever you're doing in games, if you're going outside of games, you would probably make more money. But we're in games because we really like what we do. We love that uh, you're always playing, you know, you're making things that are fun. Like my best day is like, hey, this thing's really awesome. I had an impact and like I just have fun playing with it. And my worst day is like, oh, like the software doesn't run. As opposed to if I was in like the medical industry and I'd be like, my worst day is like, oops, I didn't catch a usability issue and a talker kills me. Right? Like, <laughs> my worst day is not bad. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's really not. <laughs> we're we're thinking of virtual coins as opposed to one of the mm -hmm. virtual coins. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> we'll experience coins. Uh, yeah. 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 Sometimes, so, yeah, sometimes it's on par. Yeah. So yeah, the thing is, uh, with Matt said, we're, we're entertainers first. First and foremost, you have to love entertaining people in games. Um, you know, I sort of that's the reason I got into this industry uh, is to, to actually have fun with what I do. So, um, yeah, like everybody said, the hours. You have to get used to it, you have to enjoy it. And if you're lucky and you're with a group of people who are all very dedicated and talented, love what they're doing, so you can have this, this family to work. Um, they're all there together in the trenches, so it tends to be a great, great time. I have more of a philosophical question. Games provide a highly structured, um, uh, even if they don't look highly structured, they they do provide a highly structured set of scenarios that, that, that eventually somebody's going to do this and it's going to do that. There's a lot of cause and effect programmed in. Um, so how does that affect out-of-the-box thinking? Because by definition, the game is the box. And, and, but I, I understand that people have their own little boxes, and the game can show them something that they may not have ever considered before. But um, truly unstructured, putting this and this together, is, is there any thought to that in games? I would suggest there's actually an entire genre of games that that is like the core of it. They're called sandbox games. Yeah. Um, so things like an Assassin's Creed or a Saints Row, um, where you basically have a set of rules of like basically simulating like some functioning of the world, and you just let people go and do their thing. Uh, I know when I talked to the guys who do Saints Row, um, they are having conversations about things that they get from data they track off the back end that people don't figure out until they're like 200 hours in. Uh, it's things that designers never thought of. So, like, they have a gun in the game called the Chum Gun, and it basically shoots like Chum at something, and a shark jumps up and tries to eat it. And they discovered that some people discovered playing that if they have two people in the game, one person hops in a car, starts driving down the street really fast, the person shoots it with a Chum Gun, like a shark will come up like it's going to try to eat the thing, it just rockets you into the air. Like it basically creates a like jump that you go flying. Uh, and that's a perfect example, I think, of people just kind of going out of the box with, like, here's this basic functioning, and I'm just going to do something crazy. Like, it was never thought of, it was never intended. It was just people saying, here's kind of a rule set, let me see what I can do to push it to its limits. So that kind of scenario requires a, a level of reality programming is very high. 